So uh, first of all, thank you all so much for being here. It's a real pleasure and honor to be able to share with you um, things that have been enjoyable and meaningful and transformative for me. So today I will be presenting on a subject called creativity and movement for personal transformation. In order to create, we need to move. We are all embodied beings. So all this means is we all have a body and um, what we do with our time here is expressed also through the body. So the more we build uh, a mindful connection with it, um, the more we can enjoy and express more freely in the world with it. We create our lives every moment of the day. So um, although much of life can feel like it's out of our control, um, we are not just passive recipients. Life is not just happening to us. We, through our thoughts, our intentions, are consciously creating um, every moment of the day, whether we know it or not. We use movement to express this creativity. And I will discuss this more as we go further into the presentation. Connecting creativity and movement. Creativity and movement are innate and essential for all human beings. We embody creativity as a form of intelligence, which is expressed through the movement of our bodies and minds. So creativity can sometimes be seen or treated as less valuable than more um, structured productivity or even childish, but really it is, um, it is a gift that we're all born with and it is a high form of intelligence. Um, it's not replaceable by machines or, or even other people. Um, it's uniquely our own, each of us. When consciously embodied together, creativity and movement are powerful tools for enhancing our positive inner and outer growth. The world is created in the mind. So your achievements, your relationships, the things that you possess, the stories that you have, um, that have made up your life, that you tell about yourself, all of these have been um, created by you, whether it's conscious or not. Um, if you, let's say you have a goal in mind, and that would be like an achievement, you first have to kind of be aware of it and envision it being a possibility before it can manifest into a living reality. And the same goes for the people we meet, the things we acquire, and the, the different stories that develop in our lives. The world is created in the mind, so also your body and the skills you have have originated from your imagination, the, the, the thing that makes things uh, possible, that has the, the seed that is able to grow out into the world. You are creating whether you are conscious of it or not. What you want is to become conscious of every aspect of your life so that you can create consciously and not live a script or allow others or the world to write your script for you. So again, we're not passive recipients. Um, there will be times of challenge, which may not be our first choice uh, that we have to accept or adapt to, but a lot of our lives is really uh, self-created as well. And, and the more we're conscious of that, the more we can create and manifest the reality that we want. The pathway of creation. So things begin with a thought or an intention. And you can maybe even relate this to um, your own experience of where you are now um, with your job or relationship or a goal you've had in your life or just where you're at in general. So it starts with a thought and an intention. 
And that manifests feelings and emotions, and they may be positive, negative, neutral, but these feelings are what then uh, combine with our thoughts and intentions, gear us into actions and or reactions. And our actions slash reactions create the, the reality, the living reality that we have. So all of these together manifest the reality that exists right now. The world that you have created, it becomes embodied in your posture. And if you look around, uh, there are so many living examples. So if you play a certain sport, um, it is quite, and you play it at a, like you've played it for a long time at a proficient level. When you look around, you may be able to recognize an athlete of your own sport just from seeing how they walk in a shopping mall, not when they're on the playing field. And, and it tells a story, just the posture, um, how they're carrying their, their skeletal system. Um, and and uh, later, we will also go into body language. But now we're just looking at posture, telling someone's age um, or potential age, um, if they have injuries or have stored injuries and still uh, mentally and emotionally are holding on to them, if they've gone through trauma or if they're very youthful and vibrant or kind of tired, like the posture will, will tell a lot of stories um, based on the world that has been created in the mind. And um, these stories are expressed through your movements as well. So how you like to create, how you like to express comes out through your physical expression. Um, and movements does not necessarily mean a formal movement practice, like you don't have to be going to a movement facility or a dance studio or a yoga studio or practicing parkour. Movements as in basic movements in everyday life, how you are cleaning your house, how you're walking, um, basically movements meaning moving the body in the simplest, purest sense. So it will be expressed through your body language, the different ways that you communicate. So maybe we're communicating even through text, not through uh, like physical um, movements that are really big or visible but there is still a movement happening from the mind and out through the body and um, there are definitely cultural and stylistic expressions um, as well as gender so maybe certain hip movements are more culturally acceptable for females than males or in one culture compared to another um, so all of these are impressions that we take on and will be expressed out through the body. Uh, maybe someone who is very attuned and well embodied has very refined movements um, and a lot of freedom in them. So th these are things that we can see in ourselves and also see across like everyone else around us. There's so many stories being told through the body and seeing living examples. So it's going back to how the world is created in, in the mind. Um, I've just brought up a few examples. One could be like a 30 plus year old woman who may even have had a couple of kids and is not physically fit or in good shape, maybe even a bit overweight, but she somehow gets very inspired by a video or by a friend to uh, take on pole dancing. And she, she loves it. She loves how um, it looks and how she thinks it would make her feel and just finds it so beautiful. So she sets an intention, has that thought, and then it brings out good positive emotions in her. So then she takes action and she goes to a studio and goes to class five times a week for a few years and that manifests a different reality. So maybe her physiotherapist would have said, well, you're overweight, you're 30, you're not gonna start a brand new skill from scratch that is really demanding and acrobatic. But in her mind, if she can envision herself doing that, she may even become a champion competitor within a short number of years. Um, an 80 year old swimmer, maybe 
and eight-year-old man has been swimming since he was 23. No one can tell him that he's 80 and he shouldn't be swimming three kilometers a day because he's always done it. So that's the story that he has um, accepted within himself. It's not been projected from outside. A three-year-old child, this is one of my favorite examples. And I use this a lot in class and when I'm teaching, looking at the world from the perspective of uh, like how you imagine, if you don't remember when you were three, where things are fresh and interesting and fun and the world is full of endless possibilities. Even seeing the movements um, of sweeping the floor can be a game rather than a chore. A scholar, again, and maybe imagining creating something that didn't exist through the intellect. Financial manager, um, understanding that an abundant mindset can bring material abundance. Hypochondriac, another one. So it's not always positive. We create our um, living reality. So maybe if, if uh, trauma, for example, has not been properly processed or addressed and healing has not happened in, in a way that was uh, lasting and transformative, then you will see the person reliving those issues over and over again. And you will probably have a friend or a relative who is always having something, um, some severe health issues, some minor health issue, injuries, niggles, gut health issues, like they never end. And that's with uh, the mind having kind of become stuck in a loop and reproducing, recreating what um, it thinks it doesn't want, but what it's come to know as norm. Um, same thing can go for a victim mentality. And that's not to say that victims don't exist. Of course, there are uh, very challenging and traumatic things that happen to people in the world. Um, but often what can happen is that that the mindset remains stuck there and reproduces similar things long after there's any external threat. Um, and finally, the artist could be a bit like the three-year-old child where things are open, uh, an open canvas free for endless possibilities to be expressed through. How do you practice creativity? Can it help every human being? Do we all need to sing, draw, paint, or dance? Creativity is not one big masterpiece, although it can be that too. Um, it can be in any part and every part of your life. And we will discuss this more as we go further into the subject. Um, the idea is to kind of find presence and spontaneity and openness throughout our uh, daily lives. The Cambridge Dictionary defines creativity as the ability to produce or use original and unused ideas. In order to be creative, we need to be present, open, receptive, authentic, and see each moment as a new opportunity in the play of life. So creativity can definitely help every human being. Um, it's not about pursuing something great, um, or if it is, that's more coming from an abundant mindset, not a lacking mindset, um, where we are inspired to move upwards and not trying to fill a kind of void. So that's quite um, an important part. So we want a kind of positive um, expression of creativity. How do we go from cooking to movement? So in this presentation, I will share some of my personal story and the two are um, intimately connected and made a significant part of my journey. So it will make sense in a moment. How cooking helped my movement practice? So I was, um, so I'm a movement teacher and my first 10 years of movement practices were based around martial arts. And the main one was Muay Thai in which I was uh, competing professionally. So I retired from the sport and I began, uh, I 
I delved into this um, general expansive world of movement. Uh, but my training at the time was very structured and very intense. So it was around four to eight hours of training, six days a week. Um, and it was awesome. However, after um, around four years, I reached a point of burnout. Um, I had lost, I did not have any energy surplus. And I also lost uh, inspiration, motivation, direction. Um, and it was very concerning because that's all I had kind of done and identified with for a long time, being this movement person. And with the burnout, I started getting just random injuries, a little niggles and also big ones. Like um, I, I developed a hip issue that uh, didn't allow me to walk properly for several weeks and um, just things were not going well. And the injuries I could not really um, understand because I was training less and doing more nourishing training or so I thought but they would just come while I was, when I was fighting, I would be <laughs> relatively injury free. Injury free. Um, and at the same time, my business was also falling apart. So I was uh, living and teaching in Sydney. And during this time, as much as I tried to work hard and be positive, um, I, I'm certain that it was sensed that I was not in a good space. So people understandably left. So I had very few students left. And this became the start of a three-year identity crisis. So during this time, um, I was aware that behind suffering, there is always a gift and that the perspective has to change not by uh, trying to change the external circumstances like the people, the environment, the uh, financial environment, none of that. It was really like, what can I do? Because obviously I have manifested my own issues without understanding really what was happening. Um, so I looked to the other thing that I loved as much as movement practice. So I had began martial arts at the age of 15. And since then, throughout my movement practices and martial arts experience, I always had really awesome mentors that guided me and, and shaped me um, in really beautiful ways. And cooking started at the same time. However, it was completely self-taught. Um, of course, Nothing is just created out of thin air, not usually. Um, so I did have, you know, I, uh, like relatives giving me tips. I would watch cooking shows, read books, um, travel a lot and ask locals how would, they would make their street food. So the two skills or passions, I should say, developed at, for a similar time period and at a similar level, except that the movement stuff became my profession. So I still loved cooking and I realized that I had this like joy and freedom in cooking. Um, I was not afraid to be creative. While in my movement practice, I was very much used to following um, a strict process that would guarantee me results. And when I lost interest in those and that, I was kind of left um, hanging. I didn't know what to do. So I worked on transferring the positive qualities I had from cooking that could help address the qualities that were missing in my movement practice. And this is both for my own practice as well as uh, my teaching. Transforming cooking into movement. So these are the different qualities that um, I over time understood and started to kind of transfer into the area that I, I felt I was lacking and I was really needing some inspiration and guidance and there was no um, physical teacher around at the time um, that was appropriate for me. So approaching the unknown ingredients with openness and confidence that I would know how to use them. working with the seasons. Uh, this is quite a huge one that in the last couple of years has become a very big part of my practice. So um, I looked at the depletion that I felt, the lack of energetic surplus, 
uh, in my training and I realized that I was being too controlling. I was always following a program to achieve certain goals that disregarded the environment, the seasons, the, the people, whatever it was. It was just follow the program and achieve the goal. And, and that has its shelf life, really, sometimes long, sometimes not so long. Um, so in cooking, I saw the connection with food to nature and to the seasons. So I would shop in the farmer's market and, and really very quickly understand that um, things from the earth should be like, or the ocean should be geographical in relation to where you are and seasonal. And ingesting these foods is actually much better for you because they have properties that align with the, the, the elements, the, the quality of the weather at the time. There's also uh, no coincidence why in um, spring we may be more vibrant. And in spring is when I would put more bouncy stuff, more playful stuff, like animals coming out to play. Um, or in summer you want to eat cooler uh, foods like salads, while in winter you want richer, warming, maybe stews and fatty things. Um, so I started to change my training so that I could manage the energy in relation to the environment and the seasons, um, having more restorative stuff going on in winter, more energetic uh, stuff in summer, um, and, and just working with that. And then the energy levels are harmonious. I'm not going against the nature, the ecosystem within my own body. Having the food slash training serve me rather than the way around. So um, I suppose when we get very identified with something, it brings us a lot of joy in the beginning. But then when we want more of that joy, we start to chase it rather than uh, be grateful for what is happening in that moment. Um, so understanding that the movement practice should improve the quality of my life just like food improves the quality of my life and not me dropping everything to chase that. Um, it was kind of a reversed relationship that did not feel healthy and that needed to change. Applying basic foundational principles, I, had, I already had to direct the session via a flexible plan. So this is also quite important. Um, having the foundational principles. So I had been practicing different forms of movement and teaching for um, like practicing for over 15 years and teaching for like just under 10 years. So there was definitely like foundations. It wasn't just completely random, um, but not sticking to them, using them to kind of hold space and a certain quality of the practice and direction, but no fixed plan um, because life just doesn't allow you. Um, and checking in before starting, so not just arriving and going, this is what I'm going to do, but what's my energy level? What's my mood? Do I need to adjust that for the session rather than just repress it or ignore it? And, and go in and maybe it doesn't serve me, um, how I'm responding to the weather, what equipment do I have, what kind of environment am I in, what's my mental state, do I want to change that, um, or do I need to change the training because of the mental state, uh, the physical state, how the joints are feeling, the quality of the breath, all of this. So um, observational skills going up a lot rather than again being this imposing force um, and then uh, also seeing the people I was with that also makes a big difference um, so with all this seeing where I wanted to go from there rather than trying to impose my own limited vision and understanding that I can improvise from the start and not keep preparing for it, that they may never come. And that's exactly how I felt when I was doing a lot of the structured training. Um, the reason why I began all the movement practices was because the most attractive quality for me was this idea of freedom, um, to be free to express and move. But 
because my training was not creative, it was very much about following a process, I could do really awesome stuff that I never imagined I could do, but it was more like um, rather than an artist creating a piece of art, becoming really good at tracing and producing very beautiful um, traced work. So um, with cooking, I would just rock up, see what ingredients were there and taste it and make something pretty delicious from it. So I started to apply those principles into my physical practice, arriving into the park and seeing what the trees felt like and climbing around there or connecting with um, my friends and seeing what quality do we want to cultivate today or this month and working from there. Seeing others as my peers who contribute to the dish slash practice rather than my followers. And this was a big game changer. It removed so much pressure, so much ego, um, and enriched the practice, not just for myself, but also for um, the people who were coming as my students, um, not being afraid to be vulnerable, to make mistakes, to look silly, and even to ask for help um, because the idea is to hold space where everyone can grow rather than dictate what we need to do. Finding answers from the unknown when there appear to be no answers and I don't know what to do and being okay with that because that also is life and um, we have this, we can have this kind of idea about control or insisting or that if we put enough effort great things will come because we deserve them but sometimes it's also just about surrendering and seeing what presents itself as the best option my transformation so these were the qualities that came out um, in conclusion to transferring the qualities from cooking into where I was really struggling with uh, my career and my movement practice and my health. And, and so these are the kind of gems that came out. Um, huge one, turning suffering into strength. Being open to receiving answers from the unknown. Listening to nature. Trusting that areas in which I gained understanding could be transferred into areas in which I struggle. So that was exactly that process. Seeing others as my peers. Understanding that creativity and movement are boundless birthrights we all have. And finding joy in the mundane, so it doesn't have to be grand or great or rewarded for, for joy to be present. It, joy is always there, and it's, it's when we're chasing less and um, more open that, that that manifests and exists in anything that we're doing, including a, a, a apparently boring wrist warm-up or washing dishes. So as you see, these qualities are not just applicable to cooking or movement, they apply to life. Breaking free from identifications and embracing each present moment as it comes. The techniques of physical practices can be compared to the process of cooking. So I will read you um, my favorite page from my book called Sivananda Bharat Yoga uh, because it, it really connects with exactly the, the, the feeling I have with this topic that I'm sharing with you. So here goes. The technique of the physical practices can be compared to the process of cooking. How does one cook food? You take a cooking pot, put some food inside and place the pot on a fire. Why are you heating the pot whilst your aim is to cook the food? To cook the food, you need a pot as putting the food directly on the fire will only burn it. For proper cooking, the food requires an indirect heating method rather than a direct flame. In the process of cooking, it is the pot that takes the heat first and the food, and then the food begins to cook. As soon as the food begins to change, we no longer pay full attention to the heating of the pot. 
as the food approaches its final stages of preparation, our attention shifts to the finer aspects of the food until eventually we switch off the heat. After the food is cooked, the pot cools off and is discarded, but consequently the food does not become uncooked. Even though a pot is necessary to cook food, we must remember our purpose is to cook the food and not the pot. The changes affected in the food are permanent and irreversible in nature. Our body is like a pot that contains our subtle self. The practices are intended for the subtle self and should not be limited to the body. Even though we need this body for the performance of spiritual practice, it should never be the objective of the practice. Always remember, we are cooking the food and not the pot. I immediately realized I had cooked, heated, and overheated my pot for the last five years and had received no food in return. So very similar to my sentiments at the time. Um, and, and through this kind of overcooking, not understanding why I was cooking, um, came this uh, wonderful appreciation of creativity and, and feeling empowered without having so many external, um, so much external reward or success. Knowledge versus understanding. The difference between knowledge and understanding becomes apparent when we realize that knowledge may be a purely intellectual collection of facts. Understanding, however, is the assimilation of knowledge through meaningful real life experience. The mind may know something, but understanding appears only when an individual feels and senses what is connected with it or vice versa. Knowledge informs while understanding transforms. And this was shared with one of my lovely teachers, uh, Grisel. And it applies to um, this idea of transferring things from one area into another. So you can only transfer principles from areas that you already have an understanding. Um, and this is, uh, I feel, particularly applicable in this day and age where there's a lot of um, young people who look at really awesome information and try to like transfer it, but it's not an embodied experience. So it's not um, ingrained deep enough. It has to come from, from real life. Uh, so when we practice movement consciously and creatively, we can achieve incredible uh, transformation. So this connects us to nature. Um, and what's happening is when, when we are creative, firstly, we are connecting with our birthright. It, it's in within all of us. It doesn't mean that you will be the best at something, but you can be, of course, but creativity is there within you. And when we are doing movement practices, um, any movement practice, it's not that we are uh, creating a, a neural pathway that didn't exist in the brain. We are potentiating and activating those neural pathways. So if we're learning how to run faster or climb or do acrobatics or um, do gardening in a way that is not grinding away your joints, this is all stuff that's within your system, but maybe um, you or I have not had um, awareness or access or guidance to do it in a certain way. Freedom. So practicing movement consciously and creatively can help you to break uh, free from your culturally or self-imposed confines. So we take on all these layers and expectations from the world and limit ourselves, uh, maybe even feel shame to uh, try something new or fail or look silly. But really, um, the more that we can let go and embrace the like allow creativity to channel through us through the body um, the more we actually 
can experience more freedom, regardless of how the movement is perceived by others or the maybe your painting or sculpting, it does not need to be liked by others, but for yourself, it's a freedom of expression. And dreams, so manifesting the reality that you dream of and deserve through conscious uh, creativity and movement. And um, here I will share some examples that I find very inspiring and I feel honored and proud to be able to share them. Um, we have Jan, who is a friend and a student here in Canberra. She's 65 years old and recently she was um, playing with her grandkids and her husband and they all decided to measure their height and she was astonished that she had grown one centimeter taller. So as this picture shows the general expectation and often what happens is that as we age we kind of shrink. Um, our height shrinks, our spines curl, our fingers and toes curl, but um, if we have again, this imagination where we can be expansive and free and fluid and youthful, and then we take action and practice that, that does not need to be the reality that happens. Now, we never had the goal or intention of getting taller. That was just a nice, surprising, very positive side effect. Um, but it just showed that transformation can happen regardless of age, sex, location, um, it, it starts in that openness in the mind and, and of course has to be followed with uh, conscious positive action. James, James is air sense saving his life. So James is a very dear friend of mine. Um, he was also a student for over four years in Sydney. So I see him less these days, unfortunately. And um, he's been through all the different types of trainings and personal changes that I have had. Uh, he was one of the few that stuck around when most left. And um, it's just been a really awesome time um, sharing like movement and, and meals and all kinds of fun things with him. So in the last couple of years, uh, when I was in Sydney, we got a lot into uh, like, easy tree climbing, break falling, uh, martial arts exposure, and rolling, falling safely out of like, not high branches, but how to like land like a cat or roll safely. And this was something that we played more every week, pretty much for one or two years. And at the time there was, you know, sometimes bruises and uh, unpleasant sensations or fear, um, sometimes a little bit of complaining perhaps, but really it, it, he did really well. And eventually uh, when I left Sydney, he also took up Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which added to his kind of um, awareness and resilience and adaptability of his body in relation to unpredictable stress. So uh, less than a month ago, he was on a motorbike a trip with his friends and they were going off-road. Um, he was going around 70 or 80k an hour and he got into a ditch so he flew off the bike and luckily there were no objects for him to fly into but he in that split moment um, he was conscious that he was in the air and the body naturally took on the rolling shape and things that we had practiced so many times for the last uh, one or two years and when the paramedics arrived they were just amazed that he didn't break a single bone um, flying through the air at that speed and landing on the ground whilst he's had friends that fell off at 15 or 20k an hour and had broken an ankle or other um, uh, bones. So really it's uh, again a really awesome byproduct of the practice and an example of how when the food is cooked it's permanently transformed. This there, there was no way he could have rehearsed this at that level um, but it became a part of his response, his way of um, moving. 
Andy's gymnastic ring strength at 55. So Andy's a dear friend. Um, he's, he's back in Hong Kong where I lived and taught for almost 10 years. And um, I'll share this with you. So Andy is just a really inspiring example of someone who embraces his imagination, is not afraid to fail, goes after his dreams, is very playful and creative. And he went from being an investment banker to a yoga teacher because that was more fulfilling for him. And he came to me at 54 and in less than a year, he could do this incredible stuff. Um, he also went back to university to learn Chinese. And I believe he's learning Sanskrit now as well. So it really shows again that when we have that openness, that presence, that joy, and dreaming um, that really anything can be achieved and no one can tell you otherwise. The world is created in the mind. And then we have Gisela, my dear, dear friend, and she's here in Canberra. Um, she is a huge inspiration for me. There is a very beautiful connection that we have naturally. And um, she has suffered from a brain tumor and had gone, had, had surgery, um, but she still has the tumor inside her brain. And um, she is so strong and wise and positive and incredible and such a, a vibrant, um, playful being. I really see this uh, wise woman with the eyes of a three-year-old that see opportunity and positivity in everything. Um, I've not known others to suffer so much in the way that she has, but I've never heard her complain or go into victim mode or blame anything. Um, I will read one little text I was sharing with her daughter, Sophia. Um, it just brought me so much joy and, and it blew me away at how she can be so present and have gratitude for every moment, regardless of the state of the body, of the environment. Um, so I left them, as you can see here, this is called a practice ball string and ball to play with and also Jenga blocks. So there's different tons and tons of games that you can make up on the spot with these very simple tools. Here she's with her husband and in the other picture, she's holding the practice wall. So Sophia asks her, Mama, so what do you do when you see the ball? And she says, I get excited. And when you get the ball, I get even more excited. And then what do you do? I celebrate. And then what? Well, I guess I give it back so that we can keep playing. And this is just so beautiful. Um, she also um, had like inspired me the other day um, when I was visiting her in hospital and she had had a rough night. So we didn't really play that time when I visited. We kind of spent time together um, communicating, mainly non-verbally, a little bit verbally. And I, I really wanted to know what she was feeling. So I said, uh, Gisela, what do you feel right now? And then she just was silent for a bit. And she said, content, I'm completely content. And that was so beautiful because it really showed that the world is created from within. You could be, um, you know, she, she had a stroke. She could not use the left side of her body. She was in hospital with patients near her in terrible condition. And in that moment, there was complete joy and peace. And, and it was just amazing. So I'm very grateful that she was encouraging for me to share this as well because it's a very vulnerable and private thing. So yeah a real honor so to conclude creativity and movement don't need to be big events difficult or uncomfortable they should be consciously cultivated and present in all areas of our lives 
the harmony of this combination creates continued meaningful personal transformation. So I hope that um, you can take something positive from this and share it with others. And that's it for my presentation. So thank you so much for being here, for watching, for your time. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you.